One day, someone bumped into my car many, many years ago. I came out, I looked at it, I said, goodbye. I thought to myself, I'm going to sit here and everything's going to happen and the police are going to come and this damage is worth 200 quid. Subhanallah. And you know what? It's going to take up five hours of mine. One hour of mine is worth maybe a thousand quid, for example. Sorry, that's not, that's not my earning by the <laughs> I see one of the youngsters saying, you said it. <laughs> Mashallah. But what I mean is, it's the tension, the mind, the head and everything. Imagine I said, it's okay, let it be because it's some few scratches here. Instead of all the tension, but if it's a big damage, I'm allowed to say, okay, let me wait. Because I need this car to be repaired and whatever else and so on. So you need to gauge it and ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? This guy worships his wife. Have you ever heard that statement? This guy worships his wife. I see a lot of brothers saying yes, you know. Uh, that is not, the meaning of it is not worship as in rendering an act of worship for. No, all it means is he obeys his wife's instructions. That's what it means. And I can give you on a lighter note. And I really like this because it plugs in. We are all human beings and we like a little bit of, you know, humor sometimes. They say there was a king and he called all his subjects, the males. And he says, anyone who is ruled by his wife, come in this line. And whoever rules his wife, where, you know, the instructions are not obeyed, so to speak, or they come from you as a man, then you stand in this line. So the whole community stood in the wrong line. Allahu Akbar. They all stood in a line saying, no, if my wife sees me in the other line, I'm dead meat. You see? So what happened is, they all got one egg each, an egg. They were given one egg and there was one man who stood in the line. I'm the man, you know, in the house, I'm the man. So the king was so happy, at least amongst my subjects, there is one man who has such greatness, you know, meaning he has the quality, Rujula, you know, he's a man, you know. So now the king gave him a horse, brown horse. And the, in fact, the king told him, choose from the horses you want. So he chose the brown one and left the black one. And he rode home galloping away. Everyone else went home with one egg. So when he got home, his wife, he looked at her and says, do you know what? She says, what? Today I got a horse because I'm the boss. You see? I got a horse because I'm the boss. She says, okay, that's good. Excellent. So you're the boss. So he says, you know, I was told to choose from three horses. There was a white one, a black one, and this brown one that I've actually come with. This was the best one. She says, wow, you look great in it. You look great in this horse, but you'd look greater in the black one. He says, well, not a problem. I had a choice. I can go back and get the black one. So he goes back galloping to the castle. <laughs> and he says, oh king. The king says, yes, what's happening? He says, I just want to swap my horse. He says, why? When I went home, my wife told me that you'd look better in the black horse. The king says, no problem. He took the horse and gave him one egg. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So the moral of the story is obedience. We're talking of obedience. People say you worship someone when you obey them. You know, people say this man worships his wife because he obeys. Wallahi, we don't even understand that the example of Allah is higher. We can never ever equate Allah with any human being. But we need to know that ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also connected to obeying his instructions. And Allah will not tell you to do something that is detrimental for you. He won't. Whatever Allah has instructed you to do, and whatever he has asked you to abstain from, all of that is for your benefit, O oh man. Why is it that we want to look at it and think that this is very difficult when if someone were to tell us to do something that is not beneficial for us because we love them, we might end up doing it. Why is it that we don't show higher love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know what? If she is aging, you're aging too. Subhanallah, you're aging too. You need to look, you need to appreciate, you need to acknowledge, you need to say good words. Try it out at home today. And you can invite us for the Walima tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, you know, it will be so appreciated. A lot of us lack romance in our homes. The Prophet ﷺ talks about it. You know, I've had people come to complain saying, you know what, we haven't been intimate in two years and I'm like gosh man you know I wonder what's going on here 
One day, may Allah grant this man Jannah, he passed away. One of the Imams in one of the Masajid back at home in South Africa. The Imam was slightly late for Salatul Fajr. Slightly late, a few, like a few minutes. Now you know what happens with the Imams. Normally you have the people behind their all, hey, you late, you late. He got up, he said, brothers, don't, don't pick on me. I was engaged in another act of worship. <laughs> He says, I've come from Ibadah to Ibadah. It's a fact. And you know what? Those who understood knew what he was saying. They, and he said it. And nobody dared say a word. From that day, he was the hero of all the youngsters. They said, the man is old, but he's not cold. May Allah grant us each. We're talking of a happy family. Wallahi, I've told you. I've given you quite a bit. Obviously, we won't be able to say everything, but we've spoken about a lot, including intimacy. It's very important with the right people. Many people commit haram, and for that reason, they are blinded about their own spouses. You know, when we say the I love yous and I adore yous, and we send these messages that we're embarrassed to show our own spouses because we're sending them to the wrong people. Wallahi, if you were to use half of those haram messages in a halal way, you'd have the happiest family. Follow what I'm saying. And as we grow older, say it more. Appreciate your spouse. They sacrificed a lot for you. Subhanallah. I remember the guy. The guy saying, well, you know, my wife is a bit out of shape. Subhanallah. <laughs> Brother, you look like a pear. <laughs> you worried about what your wife looks like. Are you worried about what you look like? It's like the guy telling his wife, you know what? Your belly's a bit big. She says, I know. I'm about to be a mother. What about yours? It's big as well. <laughs> he says, well, I'm about to be a father. <laughs> <laughs> La ilaha illallah. May Allah grant us ease. We must take pride in what we look like. Yes, we must. For our own health, our own goodness. Yes, the spouse included yours. You wouldn't like, you know, uh, to waste yourself. But at the same time, you need to sometimes understand it takes a while. Some people, perhaps, they've given you four, five, three, two children, one after the other, subhanallah. And then when the children came, you know what? You were disinterested in this woman or disinterested completely for what? That's when the, the ibadah comes into play. Think about why the Prophet ﷺ said that to us. Imagine I'm sitting and thinking that must have been Masjid al Nabawi. It must have been some much more sacred place, Makkah or Medina. It can't have been a third place. It was probably Medina. In fact, if we look back at it, it was in Medina. So the Quran has left no loopholes. And the Quran also has not given the chance to someone or for someone to say, continue oppressing him because he will continue forgiving. No problem. Do you know there is a story where there were three very pious people in the masjid. And there was one youngster. So the youngster was told, you know, those people are very pious. The one in the left is still young. The one in the middle is more pious than him. And the one in the right is extremely pious. So he said, how can I know the difference between he who is pious and he who is not pious? So the youngster was told, well, they concentrate. They concentrate a lot. So he said, all right, let me see. He went to the first one. Salaamu Alaikum. No response. He was involved. This man was involved in his dhikr and recitation of the Quran. No response. So this youngster decided to give him one clap on his face. So the poor pious person got one clap on his face. And as though nothing had happened, he continued reciting. Now the man says, yes, truly this, these people are pious. And the sign of it is that they don't even notice what goes on around them. Let me go and see the one who's more pious than him. So he moved slightly to the right and he greeted again. No response. He gave this man one solid clap. The man got up and says, is your hand okay, brother? Is your hand okay, brother? So this man was shocked to say he is not conscious of what happened to him, but he is conscious of the pain that came on my hand. Allahu Akbar. Look at how pious he is. So now this is obviously teaching people how to forgive, isn't it? They didn't even discuss that it was a sin. So now this youngster is thinking to himself, whoa, that man on the right must be the most pious. Let's see what he does. He went, he greeted him again, no response. He gave him one solid clap. That man got up and gave the youngster two claps. <laughs> so the youngster says, but I thought you were the most pious. He says, someone somewhere needs to stop you clapping people. 
So this is why we need to study in Islam. We need to look at what is the best remedy for that particular situation. Sometimes you can forgive people. But if you continue forgiving them, who's going to stop that oppression? This is why the hadith says that if you do not stop an oppressor from oppressing others, then chaos will overtake the whole community. And then you will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he won't respond because you will be collectively guilty of having allowed an oppressor to keep on oppressing or keeping on oppressing the rest of the people. So it's important that we balance it as we have been taught. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. Wallahi, it's a difficult. And with us, we don't like to listen to advice. Sometimes we don't like it. When it hits us and it hits us hard at home, we still don't like to listen to advice. Let me give you an example of a man. An example of a man, and this example is only to draw the attention of ourselves. They say this man had his motorbike and he, wa he went out one day to sell the motorbike. So he passed his neighbor. Neighbor was an old man sitting outside. You know, old people, they like to sit outside in the sun and watch what's going on and so on. He says, oh, my son, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the market to sell my motorbike and I'm going to get so much money and I'm going to open a business. He said, son, say inshallah. Son says, for what? I'm going. Whoa, did you hear that? What was his statement? He said, son, say inshallah. What's the meaning of inshallah? If Allah wills. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَى إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Surah Al-Kahf has a beautiful statement. Do not say that you are going to do something tomorrow or in the future, whether it is near future or afterwards without saying that if Allah wills, without hanging it to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the old man says, say inshallah. He says, for what? I'm going. He didn't say it and he went. So he stood at that haraj, you know, that auction and he waited with his motorbike for a long time and people came, they showed no interest in his bike and they were going and the day was almost over. Near the end of the day, one man comes and says, how much are you selling your bike for? He says his price. He says, okay, can I take it for a ride? He says, yes. He jumped on it. He went. He didn't come back. <laughs> he didn't come back. This man waited. Evening came. Nightfall came. Midnight came. Nobody came back. The whole auction closed. They told him, what are you doing? I'm waiting. The man is going to come with my bike. He waited. Following day in the morning, he started walking back home. He had to walk. No money, no bike. Now when he walks back home, old man is sitting outside there. And he says, my son, you got your money. You know what he said? Inshallah, I took my motorbike. Inshallah, I waited at the, at the haraj. Inshallah, a man came. Inshallah, he took my bike. Inshallah, I gave him a price. Inshallah, he rode it. Inshallah, he did not come back. Inshallah, I'm walking here. Inshallah, I passed. He said, hey, what's wrong? What's wrong? He says, I regret. Inshallah is the word I should have said. He said, son, too late. When we told you to say it once, you didn't. Now you can say it a million times, it's not going to help you. <laughs> How? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. So we sometimes are just like that word. Or like that person who didn't utter the word. When we are told something, we don't like to listen. When it comes back to haunt us, we say, oh no, this should have happened. And now we have a big mouth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all.